is abundantly decorated. Um, all of the, uh, the kids and the families came in before, and uh, so those are all their, their handiwork, which makes it really nice. I like that a lot. Okay. I love looking at the scriptures around the miracle of Christmas, and today we're going to look at um, the passage that talks with, uh, about Zechariah and Elizabeth and the coming of John. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 1 this morning, verses 5 through 25, and then down to 57 through 64. Hear God's word. And follow along, please, in your few Bibles as we read together, or as I read for you. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children. Because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will, bring, will he bring back to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and will not be able to speak until the day this happens because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. Now come with me down to verse 57 through 64. When it was time for Elizabeth to have her baby, she gave birth to a son. Her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown her great mercy, and they shared her joy. On the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they were going to name him after his father, Zechariah. But his mother spoke up and said, No, he is to be called John. They said to her, There is no one among your relatives who has that name. Then they made signs to his father to find out what he would like to name the child. He asked for a writing tablet. And to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is John. Immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed and, began, and he began to speak, praising God. Let's pray.
your scripture, Lord, reveals so much about you to us when we are willing to look at it and be in it and take it for what it says, for what it reveals. And we ask that in this time these words would communicate your message, your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for the miracles that surround the miracle of the birth of our Savior. And as we look at it today, we pray that you would speak to us. Prepare us, Lord, for that great coming that is right around the corner that we can celebrate every year. And remember that you always deliver on what you promise. Praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so, um, so we see uh, the importance here of names. Who here actually knows the meaning of their name? Anyone? A few of us? A couple of us? It's, it's, not, it's not as big in our culture to know the meaning of our name. But back then, the meaning of a person's name had incredible significance. The world that Jesus was born into, the, the meaning of the name played great, great significance in the culture and in each person's life. Um, my name, Zachary, means remembered by God or the Lord remembers. Um, Beth, Elizabeth, who also is, is also Elizabeth in the story, not the same Elizabeth, but the same name, uh, means the Lord is absolutely reliable. The Lord is faithful um, or set apart for the Lord. Kayla, our daughter, his name means pure. Ethan is strong and, and optimistic or solid or enduring. Uh, in, in 1 Kings 4.31, uh, Ethan was um, the standard of wisdom to which Solomon is favorably compared. And then you've got our youngest daughter, and her name means hay meadow. <laughs> Just to show you that not everyone knows the meaning of the names when pick them out. But actually, but actually um, the revelation the Lord gave Beth, which I think is, is very right, uh, speaks to um, the great harvest. Uh, we believe there's a harvest coming of people coming to the Lord back from, from being lost. And so when you look at that, that, that name, Hay Meadow, it actually speaks to, to, to harvest and someone who would harvest people uh, back into the kingdom. So we see it that way. Today, we pick out names for more what they sound like. That's a pretty name. That's a strong name. That's a bold name. Or that's a family name. And we see that the importance of names throughout Scripture carried great weight. It was, it was more than your identity. It said something about who you were or what your God was like in your life. So your name actually reflected who God was and and God's people took this very, very seriously. In this passage, we find, yet again, that God is always faithful to deliver on the promises that He makes. And we come to our first one here. Zechariah means the Lord will remember. The Lord will remember. And come with me now. Go back to that morning. All the priests. And remember back at this time in the church, there were many, 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 many priests who served in the temple. And the people would all come in to burn offerings for forgiveness of sin. So it wasn't a small percentage of the community. It was the whole community that would come in. All the people would come in. They would bring their offerings. And every year, one priest would get picked from the masses to go into the place that was the holiest of holies and burn incense there. And so you can imagine the morning here, Zachariah has been a priest for many, many years. The people are all starting to come in. The doors swing open. The temple is being filled. And you can see Zachariah has been serving for many years. And he can't help but have a little bit of excitement. It's finally his turn. He's never been picked. In fact, many 
priests would serve their whole career, 20, 30 years or more, and never get picked to go into the holiest place. And on this day, Zechariah has been picked. This was such a big deal that people would say that, that this priest was, was wealthy in the Lord because he'd had the opportunity to go into that holiest of places. Maybe if you can remember the temple, there was the place where everyone would stand. Then there was a, a second area for those that were in great standing and the priests. And then there was another special area divided by a curtain. And only one would go in there once a year. And you can only think that, that Zechariah must have been filled with gratitude and anticipation. This was the crowning achievement in his life of ministry. And he comes in, he's going to be well known now, and, and he's thankful. And, and Zechariah was one who, who didn't seek um, fame for himself. He lived humbly with his wife, not in the big cities, but in the hillsides of Judea. And he carries this name, the Lord will remember. As we go back now, Zechariah and his wife Elizabeth were both priests in the line of Aaron. So people would look at them and say, these two must be really blessed because they're both of the priestly line. And so their coming together would have been a very big marriage. Only one thing happened. Their life together didn't look blessed because they had no children. Remember, children was a big deal back then. It spoke about carrying on your name, your lineage, who you were. And so he comes in and, and they have not been able to have children and he's long since stopped praying for a child because he knows that he and his wife are too old. And it's when he comes into that holiest of places, you can see him closing his eyes in prayer and opening them up in that holiest of places at the table, at the altar where the incense is burning. And all of a sudden he realizes that he's not standing there alone. You ever had those moments? You think you're alone and someone else is there? Usually not the most exciting thing. It's not someone you know. I mean, understand... He's in this place where no one else can go. And he realizes that there's another being with him. The angel Gabriel, we see him twice here in a span of a, of a couple of months. Do we know his name? Gabriel means the mighty one of God. The mighty one of God. And he comes in. He had not been seen on earth for 600 years. The last time that we saw the, the angel Gabriel, he was talking with Daniel. Do we remember this? This has to go back a little wise. And, and what he's doing is he's actually telling Daniel that the Savior is going to come and sooner than everybody thinks. He actually gives a time frame. Seventy-sevens are declared for your people, Daniel. Uh, first seven sevens, then sixty-two more sevens until the anointed one will be cut off. The exact number by the math is 483 years. He's given a promise. Gabriel, the mighty one of God, has given a promise the Messiah will come. And then nobody heard anything from God for more than 400 years. 600 since we last saw Gabriel. Malachi was the last prophet to, to give words of God. And so they're having this prophecy of God and you have a priest in Zechariah whose name is the Lord will remember. You got it? Actually a big deal. Might sound funny, but it's actually a really big deal. So here's the priest whose name is the Lord will remember, and they're talking about the greatest promise, it, what, what all the prophecy, what all the prophets, what, what they've all pointed to. 
the law, the prophets, the prophecy is pointing to this one thing, and you look at the people are going to be saying, I don't know if it's ever going to happen. It's been a long time. 600 years since Gabriel, 400 plus since Malachi, no one's heard from God, and here he is. I mean, think about what we've done in 100 years. Man on the moon, iPods. I mean, a lot of stuff's happened. We're talking about 600 years. Like that. That's so much time. And you begin to think that people are saying, hey, it's never going to happen. God was blowing smoke. And it's through this, this priest whose name means that God will never forget. And Gabriel comes and says, what has been promised will be given to you. You can just imagine Zechariah. He's like, which promise? Me having a son or the Messiah actually coming? Right? Those are the big ones that every priest would carry. And Gabriel says the answer is both. Not only both, but your son will pave the way for the Messiah. Can you imagine? Your son will pave the way for the Messiah. Do you know why this would be exciting for someone like Zechariah? We see it in Malachi chapter 4, verses 5 through 6. Remember, Malachi was the last prophet to hear from God. This is the last account they have of hearing from God. And he says this, See, I will send you the prophet Elijah before that great and, dead, and dreadful day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of their fathers to children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, or else I will come and strike the land with a curse. All God is doing here is exactly what He promised. He says, your son will come like Elijah. Don't you love, by the way, what Gabriel says? I mean, if he had to give account of himself, he says in verse 19 of Luke 1, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. I mean, that's got to be the coolest like thing to have on your business card. <laughs> right? I stand in the presence of God and have been sent to speak to you and tell you this good news. It's a long time to wait. More than 400 years since they'd heard from the last prophet. 600 since Gabriel had come. And yet he comes and says, your wife will have a son and the, and the Messiah is going to come. And then we have Elizabeth who means God is, my, is, my, is an oath consecrated to God. God is really is absolutely reliable. So you've got one whose name is God never, never forgets, always remembers, and the other whose name is God is always reliable. Do we see what God is saying? And I think that there's something that is so beautiful that we can hold on to here, which is that God never backs out on a promise. That God's plan is always good. That if God tells you something in Scripture, you can write it down as absolute for your life. And we see it here in miraculous power. I mean, here is Elizabeth who could have become bitter and angry. She didn't have any kids. Her husband good, good, was... was this whatever priest, and, and, all, and, and they were supposed to be special, but instead they were very ordinary. But the Bible tells us that, that she had, had been faithful. That she had lived well. That she had honored God. 
And in her, we see that God is absolutely reliable because even though he's not supposed to be able to, she's not supposed to be able to have any kids, she becomes pregnant with this great miracle baby. And on the day that, that, that she has this child, they go and they say, my gosh, what a, what a great thing. Here is Zachariah Jr. I mean, back then, you carried your father's name. And the name John means God is gracious. Isn't that good? The one come to, to prepare the way for the Messiah means God is gracious, full of grace, full of mercy, full of forgiveness, full of power. And, and so we have here from these two faithful followers, God is gracious, the one who would prepare the way, who would bring the hearts of the children back to their parents and their parents back to their children. I, I love this picture of what we have. Remember Elijah in the Old Testament? Remember Elijah in the Old Testament? He was the one who called down fire from heaven to burn up the altar. He told the people and all the bad kings they were evil and they, had a, they were going to pay and they were going to you know, be punished for, for all their wrongs. I mean, he came and called down judgment, which they deserved. And now, he's, now he comes back in power and actually calls forth grace. He calls reconciliation. He calls love from brokenness. He calls people to repent and people to become right before God because God loves them. And it's, it can be easy for us to lose sight of that, that God calls us to his higher standards, not because he's trying to punish us, but because he wants us to become right before him. His heart is that we could live right with him. That we could know what his plan is, what his goodness is, what is right from what is wrong, and then live it out in our lives. So that when Jesus comes, we're able to receive him. Isn't that, isn't that great? From the one whose name is God is gracious. And he goes through the land when he's born saying, repent, turn away from not following God. And I believe that voice still exists today. As we prepare for the coming of the Savior, that same voice rings out again and again. Turn away from doing what is not right in God's sight because it hurts you. It hurts those who love you. It causes problems in your lives. And not with the spirit of works righteousness where we earn our way, but with the spirit that says, Receive God's grace and stop going away from the plan. And we're reminded that nothing is too big for God to forgive. But he also calls us to stop doing that thing. We can't miss that. Yes, it's grace-filled, but it's also love-filled in that if we really do love this God that we worship, we're going to need to honor him with our lives. God is gracious. I think that oftentimes um, the world looks at the message of John the Baptist and resists it. They don't recognize the grace of God found in repentance. God calls us to a better way, a biblical way, a love-filled way, choosing right in place of what is wrong, even when it's not popular, or popular in the culture. And as I conclude, I, I want to remind us of a few truths 
We serve a God who remembers, a God who is mighty, a God who is faithful, a God who is gracious, a God who loves fiercely, a God of grace for whom nothing is too great to be forgiven, and a God who always fulfills His promises. Have you ever felt a promise or read a, a thing about God and you said, or read the thing in the Bible and you said, that, that sounds so good, I haven't seen it yet? Have you ever felt that way? I mean, we can be truthful about that. In his plan, he brought the Savior at just the right time. Now, I'm not telling you to sit and suffer because it's not happened yet. But I am trying to encourage you that we have to leave room for God to move in his time. Because his timing is always best, even when we can't understand it. And I, and I give us that word to call us to an act of faith of saying, I'm going to continue to believe what God has promised in my life. That as I'm faithful, something better is there. Amen. 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 But as I'm faithful, something better is coming. It's the heart of Advent. And I pray that for us, the same supernatural power, the same miracles that surround the birth of Christ, that those would become our experience. That God can change a person's heart. That God can bring new life from barrenness. We might think something is over and done, yet God can work through that and bring miracles. That nothing is beyond what He can do. That if we're living in a place of despair, if we give that to Him, He can and will work His truth, His power, His goodness. May the miracles get off the page and become our experience as we allow God room. You see what I'm saying? As we allow God room to move. Let's pray together. There is so much that comes at this time. And Lord, might it not be just another Christmas of going through the motions. Might the greatest prize, the greatest gift that we think about not be that big luxury car with the red bow on the driveway, but the reality of Jesus and life in him. Lord, I pray for each of us that we would see your power, your supernatural power, your supernatural love. That we would experience promises fulfilled. That our spectrum would be increased in terms of what is possible and in terms of who you are. We thank you for the miracle of Christmas and all the miracles that went along with that. Might our Christian walk, might the experience that we carry in you reflect the promises of who you are, your power, your goodness in every way. Might we be encouraged that in Jesus we have the answer to life's greatest need to know and be known by you, Almighty God. We pray these things in His name. Amen. Help us spread the message. Click on the donate button below or go to shermanoakspc.org forward slash donate. Thank you.